Hello, 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 guys! Welcome to this new edition of Mind Podcast. Uh, we're back on another week with another fascinating discussion, and I have a fabulous panel with me. Um, first, to introduce our returning, uh, our returning champion, Jam Rug, who's the director of VMR, cephologist and stuff. Before we do our guest of honor introduction, Jay, I have to introduce my uh, co-conspirator on this. <laughs> so, thank you, thank you. Back, but. Um, uh, we are we are very honored uh, that author, journalist, columnist, and uh, more re- important author of the recently published fabulous book on the BJP, Nalin Mehta, is joining us on my podcast today. Nalin, thank you so much for joining, uh, uh, and it's a great pleasure to have you on on my podcast. Thank you very much, Adit, for doing this um, while you are traveling. I follow my podcast and also um, I think the guest of honor, Jay. Uh, this book couldn't have been done without Jay's great input. So I think it's fabulous to have Jay here. The kind of what I have learned from Jay uh, in terms of psychological insights, in terms of um, brainstorming on some of the methodology that was invaluable in the making of this book. So it's great that we're having this book. So my, my thing is, like, and before we get into the book also, just to understand any political party in India or their impact, you have to start with the ideological base, where they came from, and ultimately what is the electoral context of it, right? So it is, it is very important, like, for me, what drew you to your book is the first, I would say the first essay itself where you talk about the Jansang and the origins, mm. when you talk about the uh, the, Paki- the refugees from Pakistan, you know, your own personal story about it coming to Delhi and stuff. Because I cannot tell you, I have talked to so many people in Delhi and uh, my, my own grandfather will tell me about the Jansanghi days when uh, it was... Congress was in power, but a lot of traders, especially who are uh, business oriented, would support the Jansang. And I mean, I, I come from a family in Ahmedabad, right? So where, where mm. there was a little bit of a Jansang hold since the 60s and 70s. And then he would mm. say that a lot, but BJP as a party would come in from... Uh, emanated in Delhi, right? Now it's a different issue that it's on a state level, it's no longer as powerful as it was probably 20, 30 years ago when it was considered almost impossible to defeat BJP in Delhi. So Hmm. a lot of books, discussions on BJP does not start with this point. And I I believe it is sort of almost not doing the the political uh, movement in India justice if you don't start from this point. So what brought you there and your, you know, perspective on that? So, um, I'll start with the last point you made, what brought me here, and then I'll answer the Jansen part. Um, The reason why I wrote this book is because, um, see, most books on the BJP are either totally hagiographical, um, uh, talking about the great leader or talking about the ideology, but from from a very one-sided view, or they're absolutely critical. Um, and that's, there's another market for that. There's a market for both these things. What, where I was coming from is that since uh, 2014, the BJP has won more elections than it has lost, both at the central and at the state levels, or it has done better in compared to before 2014. Why is that happening? Um, why, how, how is it that a party which, uh, which had a certain vote base is managing to attract more and more voters across divides of class, caste, gender, specifically gender, uh, and in some cases, religion as well. So the the question I wanted to start with was why? Keeping aside our ideological predilection or what we want to happen or not want to happen, or whether value judgments of whether Hindu nationalism or the BJP is good or bad for India, I wanted to put that aside because I felt that, you know, all of us, anybody who follows Indian politics or the BJP or politics in general has a view on what the BJP stands for, right? Uh, uh, And that view comes from various factors. Now, that's a stupid position. My point was that we are also prisoners of our eco chambers, whether you're from the left or the right. I want to get out of the eco chamber and objectively look at what is happening in this country. That's one. Second is, um, on the Jansung, I think it is uh, to understand today's BJP, one has to start from the beginning from the wellsprings of its ideological thought. Hindu nationalism, unlike, see, Modi is often been compared, rightly or wrongly, 
to a, a whole bunch uh, to a rise of a whole bunch of populist leaders around the world whether it was Donald Trump uh, or or other leaders in Brazil or others people around the world have often made comparisons about Modi i don't agree with many of these comparisons because they are wrong but uh, the point is unlike say um, uh, uh, unlike say a boris johnson uh, in the uk who completely um, uh, reshaped the conservative party's traditional politics or say donald trump who often stood for much of the opposite of what traditional conservative republicans have been hindu nationalism in india is not a new idea and modi uh, personally uh, outside of his personal politics the ideas that modi embodies have been in finished form since the 1940s from the time of the jansan the difference between that time and today is that the jansan in the 50s attracted a very small portion of the vote share it wasn't even the most important uh, the biggest political party in india in the 50s the biggest opposition to the congress was the socialists uh, and jay would know this better than i would and then uh, but today it is uh, the, the ideology that the jansan embodied today uh, in the form of the bjp which was formed in 1980 is the single largest poll of the indian polity there's no question about that right the other thing is today's bjp whether you you what was once called the core issues of the bjp whether it is uh, kashmir ram temple became a core issue much later only 1989 with the with the palampur resolution and it was ek vidhan ek pradhan the shama prasad mukherjee yeah, exactly. correct exactly you look at kashmir the article you look at bjp signature moves since modi has come to power ideologically article 370 caa um, all of these things Uh, uh, or, the, or on the question of of uh, of uh, removal of triple talaq, all of these things there's a direct line to the debates that happened in the 50s in India between the Jansen and Congress uh, on the other side and Nehru. In fact, there is a direct line not just between the Jansen vis-a-vis Nehru slash Congress, but for fights between Nehru and the Congress right wing, which was as right wing as the Jansen. And Nehru single-handedly stemmed that tide. In fact, he redefined the first election of India as a fight between secularism and communalism. Um, when, uh, the, whether it was the Jansang or the Hindu Mahasabha or the RSS, which were not contesting, they were not really the most important polls of the polity at that time. But Nehru defined that election basically because of this. And we cannot understand today's BJP's ideological position without understanding what was happening in the fifties. Yeah, no, and absolutely, and, and, and in some ways, a lot of people were saying that because of those definitions, what had happened was there was a broad bracket of uh, issues that were considered right of center, where it was not really people who were agreeing with each other, but they are like, "Acha, we've all been pushed to the side, so let us all come together and form like a broad-based coalition." Right? I think what. in the last few years we've seen right and i'm coming to you jay in a second in terms of political impact is recognizing that what issues collate what combinations work right and and i think what you refer to also about the caste combinations that's a, that's a question i want to ask you about uh, later about what you know how the game in up was played but i figured we'll keep that for the last because right now we are in middle of the up elections so what better way to end but to talk about uh, how the caste equations have panned out i um, may say something about the jansang and uh, refugees because that's something you refer to yes 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 absolutely Please. so you know one of the reasons why i also wrote this book is because um see politics is often personal in more ways than one the rise of the bjp uh, all of us in india you know we we are all part of whatsapp groups families <laughs> friends alumni and every day there is some fight on some whatsapp group where people whether leftists or rightists they leave a group and you know this affects you in more even for those who are there are some who are poly, overtly political in their public uttering and there are those who think this is not my thing but yet it touches us you know there are fights in families the creation of the ram temple you know in my alumni group there was such a fight over on the day when the ram temple con- consecration happened whether the prime minister should have done it or not so so my own personal journey has been this I am a child of Punjabi refugees who hmm. came to to Delhi as refugees. Both sides of my family, um, uh, one side is from Lahore, one side is from Te- Toba Tek Singh. Um, as you rightly said, the BJP originally or the Jan Singh originally was a party of Punjabis in Delhi. Uh, that has changed in the last twenty years. Yeah. That was one side. My grandfather was sympathetic to RSS 
or Hindu nationalist causes because of what he saw in partition. My father, who was born in India and joined the army, uh, born in independent India uh, in 1950, um, uh, was a diehard or is still a diehard Nehruvian secularist. Um, and the first fight that I witnessed as a child, the first political fight I witnessed as a child in my family was between my father and my grandfather over the Jai Sri Ram sticker, which was the um, yeah. the the um, the clarion call of the Ram Temple movement. I was a very small child then, but I saw this argument, and then my grandmother intervened. So this has been in, intertwined in the in the India that I grew up in. Then when I got married, it turns out my mother-in-law was a turns out to be a car saver. I was covering the riots in 2002 in Gujarat, uh, and which was which also started with the with the death of car savers who were burnt in Gudra. And then it turns out my, my mother-in-law had been as a car saver both before the demolition and after the demolition to Ram Temple. And I started having these debates with them um, about why do you support this? What does it mean for the place of Hindus? And the kind of arguments that I was used to having in my professional circles or in journalism or in public utterances, the idea of India, secularism versus communism. Her thing was, Hamare Bhagavan, all of these things didn't, this was, you couldn't have the kind of debate I was having. Thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, it made me question a lot of things about what is it that works politically. And, and that, I think, was a very, um, one of the major reasons I wanted to understand what is happening in this country and why BJP is growing. So uh, and yeah and and so coming to coming to you Jay about politically right like what Nalin talks about in, in terms of the electoral significance right what do you think is wrong right I think it will be lazy analysis for on anyone's part to just say that the BJP ke Ram Temple ke baad aage fir rahe gai, right because the fact is that the 2009 elections almost brought them to pre Ram Temple levels in terms of uh, uh, national vote share right but to go from there to almost 150 uh, percent jump. Right, it was unreal in 2014. So, if you can chronicle that, and what does the data tell you about the shifting ideological persuasions of India? Okay, I'll first try to enunciate, uh, uh, you know, uh, the first point that Nalin talked about. I, I just, I, I just want to broaden that same perspective. I, I, you know, I, I, I want to give, you know, shine some more light on it. I think Nalin has made a very important point. First. That you could not compare this to Boris Johnson or some other comparisons, some other paradigms that people were using. And, and you know, I'll just try and chronicle that itself a little bit. Uh, the DMK, for example, you know, is a, a party born out of the Justice Party first. The Justice Party, the Ravida Kargam and Tamina, which is a phenomenon of just the last century. I mean, it's, it's not something more older than that. Uh, you know, the communist parties themselves evolved within a century or century and a half, not more, right? But here was a thought process which was much more older, even in terms of the dialectics it was having, right? So you have the Holkers and the Marathas actually first asking for Ayodhya Kashi and Mathura. And it's very old. We're talking of 16th century at that time. Right? So, there is a sort of, whether the thought is acceptable or not, debatable or not, there is a precedent and a continuity that has been there. Right? And that's that's the paradigm most people who are comparing the Hindutva ideology to the other ideologies, that's what they're missing. They were trying to look at it from a different perspective, maybe in a rather in a very boxed way. That's what Nalin has broken out. So I think he first deserves the big standing ovation for that. He's broken out of that box. He's actually tried to look through a much longer lens and say, why did this emerge? So that's, I think that's kudos to Nalin. That's what we should actually be talking about. And why, why has this happened? What's the long history? Uh, now coming to your point, you know, chronicling BJP in the recent years. See, the Vajpayee BJP uh, it came to a certain level of saturation by the time you were hitting 2002 and 2003. So that BJP got a toehold in Orissa as the third largest party. Yeah. Right. That BJP also got a toehold in Bengal as a third largest party as a junior partner to Mamta Banerjee. Right. That is what where they were right until 2004, 2006. That assembly election, they were junior partners for Mamta. Right? Now, 
the key is uh, you know again i go back to what nalin has been saying that as such there has been a continuum to this ideological move it's been there maybe at a subtle level at a subterranean level it's been there for a long time right i think what uh, the advent of the 2014 election did is mobilize that undercurrent because there was an explicit leader for it at the top you know it was like saying that you know hey you know the dalits vote only for a party a or b but certainly in our election uh you know 1998 96 voting for large numbers for a certain party because there's an explicit leader right i think modi filled that slot of explicit leader and actually galvanized that entire subterranean so that's that that is what i would call phase 1 of the bjp okay i mean the post 2009 bjp that's phase 1 that propels them to 31% right now that 31% however however that 150% rise is yet making most of its existing strongholds yeah. in a sense the bjp peaks in madhya pradesh yeah. right it peaks in gujarat it peaks in rajasthan right even maharashtra it it does the best in maharashtra right but it's still within its existing territory yeah. i think it is a journey after that which is much lesser in terms of numbers so it's a jump from 31 to 37 only 6 but that journey has a far more greater lateral uh, base to it right mm. so you have the bjp picking up votes in telangana now for example telangana it was always since the days of the nizam mm. was a right pick for the bjp It, the people they fought against the razakars i mean even today uh, the mention of the razakar army evokes strong sentiments over there no, so so to 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 ha sorry yeah jay yeah, go on yeah, so so the bjp is only after 2014 in a position to break even those barriers it's also in a position to cross 50% vote in states like bihar in jharkhand right there genuinely the welfare model of the party has worked it's helped it replace the principal opposition in states like orissa right and i think that is where again alan's work is extremely fundamental because it's taking the ideological continuum seeing how the new distribution model of the party and the government adds up and builds the large umbrella So I think so, once again, Nalin gets that entire picture right. So you actually um, coming to you, Nalin. Now the, you, she, Jay actually alluded to this, right? I think one of the uh, key. Uh, I I saw the 2004 elections very closely. I was uh, uh, a lot of people uh, alleged that I was, you know, uh, not in my senses very young. But I'm like, no, I did see it very closely. But the reason I laugh about that is because I think Modi understands the Bajpai. fallacy of 2004 where he went completely to a market oriented model which india needed economically but not focusing as much on the social side of it right i think the swing that we see in the current modi bjp post to post the whole land acquisition bill happened where it became into sort of a uh, you know where social sector schemes were given significant importance or these those became the flagship schemes rather than disinvestment and things like that of the government recognizing that if i want to make broad based the bjp i'll have to take it to rural india right but but i before we come to that point i want you to elaborate on one point right when we said the ideological meshes were merging now in 2012 in gujarat you had a very fascinating result in the assembly election when the uh, single largest party the opposition and the third largest party three leaders were all rss swayam sevaks all three ex bjps mr vaghela mr keshubhai patel and narendra modi now if if you ask that what a different ideology did the congress stand for or the gujarat parivartan party stood for or the bjp stood for and if you look at mr vaghela and mr keshubhai's past statements and so forth uh, mr modi might end up being sort of the more milder of those three leaders right so there is that dichotomy also ki within like what jay said 
the expansion of BJP within the existing sort of footstep. Did you see during your research that you found that people who were already ideologically one way, but they were voting for another party, suddenly post the rise of Mr. Modi, they swung towards the BJP? Okay. So first on the um, on the question of ideological positioning with the Congress and the BJP in the Gujarat example that you raised, I think that's a perennial problem that comes up for the Congress. The BJP at its best or by best i mean i'm not making a value judgment when it's when it's uh, uh, when it's getting its politics or its messaging right the bjp what it stands for ideologically is very clear the congress often tries to play all uh, tries to be all things to everybody I mean, you is gujarat is one example in the madhya pradesh election of 2018 you look at the Congress manifesto, it was talking about Gauchalas, we are talking about a Rampat Yatra, uh, you know, it, it was as uh, Ram oriented as, as any as any other party. So, so I think, um, so, so the, uh, uh, I mean, going back to the, uh, to the locks of the, of the Babri Masjid, uh, they were also opened by Rajiv Gandhi. So I think the Congress often ends up falling between two stools, uh, yeah. with Rahul Gandhi becoming a Shiv Bhak in the election. So that's a perennial problem for ideological positioning. Um, on the question of what has changed for the BJP, um, see, 2014 was, uh, you could dismiss 2014 um, if you didn't know what came after. 2014, Mr. Modi comes comes in. There's been eight years or, or, or 10 years of a UPA government. There is very high anti-incumbency against the UPA and, uh, and, and, and the Congress-led UPA. Mr. Modi has created a brand for himself by that time as uh, of, uh, of being a chief minister in Gujarat for X number of years. So he, uh, he rides on that and becomes uh, the alternative voice which India votes for. But 2014 was about that. Uh, that is... A, but but after that, the triumph in UP in 17, the triumph in 19, which is a bigger triumph than 2014 uh, for Mr. Modi, that is after you've seen the BJP in power and Mr. Narendra Modi in power for a long period of time. That requires a much deeper analysis. That's not just a reaction to anti-incumbency. That's an endorsement of, of his prime ministership and of the BJP in governance. So I think what the BJP does with Narendra Modi, see, there's no question that Narendra Modi remains the uh, most powerful, popular leader in India by a margin even today. There's been some fall in the popularity during the COVID period uh, a little bit, but that's recovering. But in general, between him and the rest, uh, uh, as individual leaders na at a national level, he remains the tallest leader in India. There's no question the BJP gets a, 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 a premium from the Modi brand. Um, there are some people who vote for the BJP because Mr. Modi is there. But... The BJP is far deeper than that. In the last five years, it's made major structural changes. And I think those who think that in a post-Modi era, when Mr. Modi uh, is not in the picture, whenever that happens, uh, uh, the BJP will collapse. This was a white black swan event. I think they're wrong. I think the BJP is built deep roots in this country in the last five years. And, and this has been by design. Uh, uh, it is, this has been through a very clear strategy. There's three or four major changes the BJP made post-2014, the new BJP, which I call the title of my book, is very different from the old BJP of pre-2014 in three or four different ways. One, in there are three reasons. First, uh, in the Hindi heartland, the 10 Hindi-speaking states of North India, which are the bulwark of the BJP's advances post-2014, and UP in particular, which has got 80 Lok Sabha seats, the first difference in the BJP in which we've seen in the last um, uh, seven years now is that the BJP has become the default party of the village. It's become a rural party. The old BJP was largely an urban-focused party. Uh, and, and this is something we tracked, um, not just seats where it won, because that can change. We tracked the, the, the growing depth of its vote share. When a party uh, in, uh, in a multipolar system starts getting more than 40% the vote share consistently that shows that you are either the primary poll or one of the two polls of election in that constituency whether you win it or not and look at the numbers um uh, what, what, do, what do i because this is a counterintuitive uh, claim to make that the bjp is now the, uh, predominantly a rural party it didn't lose its support in the urban area but it became a rural party why do i say that and jay helped us map this in seats in the hindi heartland where it won 40 percent vote share in lok sabha seats there are 225 seats in the Hindi heartland, Lok Sabha seats. 127 of them are rural. 
40 uh, the bjp won only there were only 21 seats in 2019 where the bjp had 40 percent vote share 2014 that went up to 73 seats but 2019 that went up to 95 seats that's 74 percent of the rural seats bjp was winning more than 40 percent vote share that's one uh, if you look at up there are 46 rural seats out of the 80 Lok Sabha seats in UP. 2009, BJP won 40% vote share in only 8% of those seats. 2014, in 82%. 2019, in 76%. That tells you the growing rural depth of the BJP. Now, the question is, why does this happen? There are three reasons for this. The first is, the BJP builds new caste coalition. The old BJP was largely an urban-dominated a Brahmin Baniya party, which was a stereotype. Although that stereotype was also not always accurate, because Jay knows Kalyan Singh, after all, was uh, the great OBC leader of the BJP. The Babi Masjid demolished. At that time, he was the chief minister of UP. But it was a different model. What has happened post-2014 is that the BJP significantly expands its base. It retains upper caste support, but it draws in a very significant chunk of non-Yadav OBCs and non-Jatav uh, Dalits, to a lesser extent, into its trend. It becomes a school, it becomes the most representative, representative party by caste in UP, barring Muslims. And this I do not say lightly. Because it's not just that it, it attracts these people to its trend, it gives them a share of power. And, and why do I say that? There are some numbers. Um, when you look at the Lok Sabha candidates of the BJP in 2019 in UP, 57.5% of them are either OBC or scheduled caste. Uh, in Vidhan Sabha candidates of 2017, 52% are from this category. Uh, in the office bearers of BJP in UP, there are 50% OBC or SC. In the ministerial council of ministers of Yogi Adityanath, how many ministers are OBC or SC? 48.1%. District presidents of BJP, 45%. This is more representative, completely different from the BJP before 2014 at one level and second level with every other party uh, yeah. in UP. With BA, because we tracked 4,000 politicians across BSP, SP, Congress, BJP over a 30-year period. Jay's, Jay and his team at PMR helped us blind peer review this data. They they also ran these checks and then we compared our data to see whether we were right or wrong. Was when I first saw it. So this is a major shift. Second is... The BJP brought in a major uh, uh, wealth, new uh, the making of a new welfare state through direct benefit transfers, which were a game changer. And we can talk about that at length. I, I just I don't want to digress on that. But see, every party spends money on welfare. After Akhilesh Yadav also spent the DMK and the uh, UDMK in Tamil Nadu have been doing it for years. That's not new. What's different is the the availability of direct benefit transfer, which was the combination of the cheap mobile phone, the Aadhaar card, uh, and 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 what the, the system which has already been created. But the BJP's willingness to politically bet on it, or Mr. Modi's uh, willingness to to double down on this uh, specifically, and then to build a political surround sound around that. Not only did the benefit net expand significantly, and I'll give you one number for this: the direct benefit welfare system was not invented by the BJP. It was started by the Congress in UP 2013 in January. Uh, the first January 2013, the, the pilot rolls out in 58 districts. Jairam Ramesh is a rural affairs minister. There are lots of issues in the in the, in the the pilot. By the time they fix it, the UP loses power. Modi comes to power. I had a conversation with Nandan Delikini, who had built India's staff, which was the background for all of this. And he had a meeting with Narendra Modi. Modi's genius was he recognized how much DBT could change the welfare architecture of this country. Now, look at what happens. In 2013-14, there are only 28 schemes that are covered by DBT, by the central government. Uh, this includes the Manmohan Singh period. By 2018-19, that number goes up to 434 schemes. It's a 15-fold increase. In terms of money, in 2013-14, 7,300 crore is spent through DBT. By 2018-19, that goes to 2.14 crore. This is 29 times more. If you add benefits in kind, that number is 45 times more, which is 3.29 lakh crores. If you look at the number of beneficiaries who benefit from this, there were 10.18 crore beneficiaries in 2013-14. That goes up to 76.3 crores in 18-19, which is seven times. So that is the nature of this change. But then the BJP built a cadre system. It launched major membership drives. 
both not before elections but after the elections of 2014 and 19 after these triumphs it launched major membership drives it built a cadre of built on what it was the bharatis with these lists going to villages and checking with them and and many of these people became bjp voters and the bjp did this at a ground level very fairly effectively i'll just stop there no no I, that's actually fascinating points and i'm going to jay next i think um uh, a couple of things uh, here nalin and, and jain i have ta- talked about this also that the caste representation during maybe vajpayee time in bjp was the leaders belonged to a certain caste so you had certain mps mlas or something i am not sure if the panth pramukh or the prabharis and some that's if it went down to that level now it has right and even with the kalyan singh issue you did have that issue where kalyan singh was replaced with ram prakash gupta and then with rajnath singh right now the leader has is essentially a yogi adityanath who is not from the obc community yet there is so much representation at the ministerial level or at the local level that this government is not seen as an anti obc government by that may i make a small point uh, before yeah. jay uh, and, and before jay comes in uh, i just want to make a small point to add to what you're saying adit mm-hmm. the difference between the kalyan singh era and kalyan singh was hugely significant and today's new bjp with modi is this see at there were other obc leaders also like uma bharti who was the first uh, yeah, uh, yeah. woman chief minister of uh, madhya pradesh uh, who was also obc the difference was that that model was like a congress model of totem pole leaders where the idea is you bring in a major leader from that community who has a following in that community and a wider following and the assumption is that that community then comes with you or a large part of that comes with you what the bjp post 2014 has done is not only doing this it has inserted these i told you the numbers for mps mlas office bearers it goes far deeper than that because the bjp at every level has a 21 member karyakarini or working council at yes. the panna pramukh level also there are 21 members then at the zonal level then at the district level then above that what it did was post 2014 in up in particular it said five of these seats out of 21 will be reserved for women 10 of these will be reserved for obc and sc right and this happened at every level of the party in up so suddenly you were getting so many more people who had never voted for bjp who were brought in the position of power from the lowest to the highest levels of the party so it's much more deeper than just the top to poll poll leaders coming now in this election you've seen some defections of leaders like swami prasad maurya and others who have gone back i don't think that makes that much of a difference because the penetration of the bjp into these castes is now much deeper than it ever was before in fact i would argue swami prasad maurya was a kind of totem pole leader who jumps around parties right there is another fellow called bridge bhushan charan singh who is like fought from every single party like and there are in up there are many daddan mishra i think he, i now is back with the bjp so there are the, but jay some would argue now uh, ironically bjp has to per, have totem pole uh, upper caste leaders like they they have to have like certain brahmin leaders in as ministers because the, the, uh, they are they are seeing dissent achievement there they're like no no we are having two or three ministers so jay your take on this and one other point i want you to elaborate on and this is post kalyan singh i think there is a straight coalition with the bjp's decline you have the bsp increase right there has never been a era in up except for maybe the 2002 elections where the bjp and bsp both have gained if the bjp if the bsp has gained the bjp has lost if the bjp has gained the bsp has lost they they tried to ally three times uh, many other times covertly uh, sometimes overtly and it has always almost always backfired right so are we going to see the same thing is the increase of a bjp does that means and like doomsday for the bsp led by mayawati i'll 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 first try and address your first question okay uh which is about you know not having totem pole leaders uh i think the bjp is evolved to a very different level now what's happened is there is a very supreme leader at the top there are also leaders at the state level uh, who are in a sort of having that supreme halo and that bracket to themselves so they are like the accelerators and the galvanizers Mm. while the party works out a huge support base cutting across the spectrum okay and then leaders are token irrespective of their caste mm. okay so that's what it is i mean i i'm really reminded of a little bit of a joke uh, not a joke 
but uh, you know something that did catch many people's attention in the 2017 gujarat election uh, there was apparently a conversation that there are no jains fielded for the election and the other side of the phone says look vijay rupani is a jain and one more jain candidate how many more jains do you want we know they have been voting for the bjp but two or three are enough <laughs> so so this this is like uh, 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 one thing that you have to remember but now this is a party with a huge as, 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 as the only jain on this panel i hold out a disagree with that sentiment but jai go on but 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 there are two or three we have to get up of course no no go on i'm just i'm just being facetious yeah, yeah. yeah, no so so the point is that it's it's a party with a base cutting across the spectrum there is a lot of accelerating branded leaders you know at the state and the national so in a sense this would be something that would uh, you know happen to every caste and community that they would have some token leaders there will be a good base on the ground for the party participation from that caste yeah. you know coming to the fact of how that whole thing has interacted with the bsp i think this is the real challenge for a lot of identity politics Uh, 2014 you know i remember before the 2014 election uh, i live in mumbai and in mumbai it's uh, very common uh, you know with no parochial bias to have a lot of the uh, uh, drivers you know come from the northern states they come here for employment uh, so my driver in 2012 used to be a yadav from up and believe me before there was prashant kishore before there was chai pe charcha before there was anything else in 2012 this yadav told me ab ki baar bjp ke liye so he said i said bhai kyu chahiye said nahi sir kaam hoga mera bhai gujarat mein hai wahan pe dekho kya kaam kiya hai friend they were taking back stories to their home states whenever they traveled home right so this very fact you know if you take it at a subtle level a lot of the parties okay that actually cultivated their own constituencies based on identity politics and a, a, a justice based on that identity really did not have much to offer post 2012 itself okay so a lot of those voters were moving towards bjp now mayavati i remember even as late as 2017 she talked of caste alliances reworking the brahmin dalit uh, you know association i think the ground had slipped a long time ago a lot of these voters had essentially started moving to the bjp as a party of the next aspiration what is the next aspiration they have right so i think uh very well that complementariness in the behavior does exist that wherever the bjp grows the bsp sh- uh, shall disseminate and uh, i think in a much more larger sense you know again uh, not to be boxed out by time a lot of these parties need to realize that uh, once people move out of a rural and an agrarian economy and into even a semi urban settlement their own spatial locations within the society change their identity is not firm they are not the same identities that they have in their villages right so in a way the very process of urbanization and industrialization is going to weaken these parts and that's precisely what is happening and the bjp because of its communication gambit because of its pr outreach is the first party to be able to reap this harvest that's the essential phenomenon fascinating and and coming to you uh, nalin next i think one 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 interesting thing that i've seen is uh, when you talk about the bjp in up right like and mr modi's popularity post 2012 actually mr modi did not campaign in the 2012 up election assembly elections for bjp so f- to go from there to 5 years later like i think he he stayed away campaigned in other states but not in up and still have that popularity was quite stunning what is interesting for me is that gujarat actually is the only Only state right now which votes on the old quasi BJP level because if you look at the data in Saurashtra and parts of rural Gujarat, that is somewhat of a fifty-fifty split or a fifty-five-forty-five split between BJP and Congress. But BJP does exceedingly well in urban Gujarat, especially Ahmedabad, Surat, Rajkot, and Vadodara. And last time, those four sort of districts propelled BJP to power because if if there was a bit of a split there, the Congress would have actually come very close to power, right? So. Uh, 
in a way when mr modi was the chief minister he, it it was a very old uh, the old technique of where bjp would sweep urban india or urban states and rural states they would do like a divide now what you have seen in up bihar uh, many other states have, they, they have um, uh, they have flipped that divide so i want to come to you to something what you refer to as the economic model right because you talked about the direct benefit transfer and it's at the heart of this and i want to quote for our viewers and listeners an instance that 2019 ke results ho rahe the and kc tyagi of the jdu was on i think z news or aaj tak i forget and someone he was talking about how bjp uh, accommodated jdu even after their whole alliance thing giving them the same seats and then he said there haryana mein se bjp won all tell and he, there is this reaction saying hey haryana mein this ki das jit gaye you know he, i mean on air and he's like he's like maine devi lal ke time pe dekha hai and it was impossible to think that anyone or bjp which was considered a very the brahmin banya party back in the day would could win all 10 seats in haryana right but uh, in spite of the chotalas being there and so forth so do you see this this 2019 being a economic election in urban uh, it was about delivery in social schemes in rural india and in urban india more of an ideological election where it might be a response to you know say pulwama or other issues do you do you almost see two elections being fought simultaneously in your analysis so i think i think the bjp played the election at many different registers Uh, and it got it right on several levels one uh, the reasons that you pointed out yes uh, on gujarat i want to say that uh, this is something that jr have often discussed in the past one of the reasons why the bjp see gujarat sociology is very different from other states one of the reasons why the bjp overcame anti incumbency in the modi years in gujarat in consistently won in 7 12 and 17 one of the reasons was that Uh, Mr. If you look at the number of MLAs, Mr. Modi would drop each election, um, and their success rate. That uh, so every election there would be an, a depletion of certain vote share from certain communities. Thirty-three percent rule by by other communities that he would bring. So it was yeah. always a very fast, flexible, reflexive politics, which right. which most people didn't realize. They thought it's this Hindu Dwar laboratory where everybody just decided. But it, you know. Every Gujarat election, the Congress team has actually looked much closer than what the final result was. And that was because they got their politics right in terms of the hard core yeah. class file. Uh, what do you think about that? I think they dropped one third MLA. Right? You can correct me if I'm exactly. wrong. Yeah, exactly. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah they, they, they they dropped. So coming back to the larger point that you were making. um the bjp in 2019 got a few things right apart from the issues though the one that you mentioned absolutely but then i want to mention two three more things and that shows you the the width and the breadth of the machine that we are dealing with um one so firstly in the like in the gujarat case there were 100 and uh, over 120 sitting mps that the bjp dropped in 2019 you look at their success rate over 85% of them won the election so mr modi was absolutely ruthless in his ticket selection that's one but structurally and strategically uh, i think the bjp expanded into new catchment areas um, as well you look at northeast uh, the bjp was the single largest party in the northeast 14 lok sabha seats by itself you add the northeast democratic alliance it gets more seats so there's been a lot of debate about the bjp's depth assam its rise in assam is a new phenomenon Uh, in in a in a country in a state which has one of the largest muslim proportion population in the country and in other states which have some of the largest christian population in the country for the bjp to to start uh, uh, making the kind of advances it's made it's quite new uh, but, the, but the third thing i want to say is the women's vote has been absolutely crucial for the bjp see in this country there's been a major gender divide on women voting since the 6 mid 60s when the election commission started giving us a breakdown of male versus women voters the the gap between male and female turnout has been very high in the in the earlier it was as much as 11 12 13% and historically women uh, between national parties voted much more for congress than for bjp a lot of studies show that what has happened in the Uh, from the early 2000s initially but in the post modi years as in post 2014 onwards specifically is that 2019 was the first election in which the women turnout rate in india was slightly higher than the male turnout rate in any general election since independence that's the first time that happened at the same time 
the the number of women voting for bjp as opposed to congress in state after state was more so just at the time when the gender divide is breaking down and more and more women are coming out in voting they are voting more for bjp than for congress and that is the making of a rural women vote that's counter intuitive because if you look at ca nrc some of the biggest movements against the bjp have been led by urban women by by women activists and yet you are seeing the making of a new women vote and there is a specific reasons for it we can talk about that but i think that is is an under appreciated aspect apart from the uh, the the welfare model that mr modi built um, see a lot of people thought that modi is going to be a new reagan or a new thatcher in 2014 he is not turned out to be that he is very clear about his positioning he is more left than the left on 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 many things uh, he is much more focused on on building the welfare net now you are seeing the form you are now seeing you are now seeing things like uh, the 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 this investment of air india you are now seeing the focus on digital digitalization has been big focus with the kind of initiatives announced by nirmal jambala sita raman in this budget but uh, the economic model has been very different uh, yeah. and i think the women vote has been absolutely fundamental apart from the social engineering and apart from the welfare model that they brought in yeah actually nalin i have to compliment you for giving me my segue before i even took it because my next segue was going to be the women vote <laughs> so and uh, we are you know we are going a little bit a little bit over time i hope it's not an issue for you guys we'll go a little bit 15 20 minutes and wrap up in that but uh, it's been a fascinating discussion uh, jay I, you know i want to talk to you about one thing because you ab ab analysis for a second i want to you to wear your pollsters at right is it is it true to assume that a lot of rural women and i'm not making a judgment call or something but when a pollster will go and ask a, a family right the women even though she is voted for bjp when her husband is voted for sp she is not likely to tell the exit pollster that she is voted for bjp if you yeah. if she is asked in front of the whole family right i'm just is it is it could that happen is that yeah. why a lot of exit pollsters got uh, you know the scale of bjp win wrong uh no i get a couple of factors one is yes uh, we normally train our researchers to go and ask the women separately or where they're at least standing alone or talking alone not to yep. be influenced by the members of the family so what you say does happen see uh, but a lot of time the scale was wrong because the proportions were not right in a sense there was this huge mass of people who even turned out in larger numbers if you look at the border areas of madhya pradesh and uttar pradesh in the 2019 election all those uh, parliamentary seats so huge uh, big gain in the turnout these are some of the most poorest and downtrodden regions of india okay so the turnout as well as the proportion was a reason people were getting it wrong the second thing is you know what i saw is it also 2019 to get the scale right also needed a very really balanced sample like so in uttar pradesh i was actually breaking down my samples by yadav obc non yadav obc jatav sc non jatav sc i mean like only when we broke it up that way we could you know i i, I remember having a, a a debate or a conversation with nalin uh, and sanjeev singh in the times of india canteen No, no. This 55 UP is not happening. And I said, look, as far as my data goes, I I see that 55 plus happening in UP, and that that was so. It was very important to get the scale right, get the turnout estimates right, and that that would have got the scale right, uh, you know, accurate. So you case. and this I can reveal now. But uh, Jay also told me in 2015, I think during Delhi elections we were talking, and yeah. at that time no one could get the app scale right. And Jay was like, boss, I'll give you basic analysis. App is getting 60 percent of this vote. उसका मैं मैथ करूं तो इट इज फिफ्टी फाइव प्लस देर इज नो वे दे आर गेटिंग लेस देन फिफ्टी फाइव एंड एंड एट एवरी वन इज सेन क्लोज इलेक्शन क्लोज इलेक्शन अगेन राइट सो but but nalin quick point and then uh, uh, go coming back to jay on this both of i want actually both of you to weigh in on this point right when we talk about the women vote um it is it is so this is this is the it comes back to the first point you were making that when the lazy analysts start equating the rise of populist leaders across the world right donald trump did not do very well amongst the women vote in us i don't know what boris johnson did um but i i so narendra modi's sort of uh, uh, vote share is very different from what how trump did in fact i would say biden did uh, better with women voters in 2020 uh, the ironic thing now is after two year one and a half years of joe biden his popularity is lower than what mr modi has after eight years of power in india 
right so how do you these are almost two separate sort of things that even though joe biden came with this whole very unifying message saying i will get votes from left i will get votes from the right i will get votes from center this time when he did the state of the union uh, this might surprise a lot of people he had two rebuttals one from the republican side and one from his own party where the far left yeah. within his own party yeah. said Rashida Tayyab led a rebuttal of and I was like this has never happened and uh, 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 the, the, to use a very NFL uh, American football uh, uh, analogy Bill Maher the commentator said this is like sacking your own quarterback or uh, mm-hmm. uh, to use a cricketing terminology this is running out your own partner right so Mr. Modi even after eight years of power has not seen the same sort of you know things which is why I refuse to sort of equate them the only similarity in all these results were the scale of the results was unexpected because they tapped into something that the establishment did not tapped into which is and that vote was like I have one vote I'm going to make myself heard that is the only sort of similarity across board so when you talked about the women vote um Nalin, do you see that there is a dichotomy in the urban, the way the urban women are voting and the rural women are voting? Because the urban women may, I mean, and I'm not, uh, like, say, ex- I'll take, take an example, the Ujwala scheme, right? Uh, the people are saying that uh, Ujwala scheme and direct benefit transfer. Uh, so gas cylinder, cell phones, and, and uh, even the whole Swachh Bharat and the whole toilets that they built, the government built, that sort of swung a lot of rural vote. Those issues, toilets and cylinders are not really issues for a lot of urban women because they don't face that uh, uh, challenge on a day-to-day basis. So their motivation to vote for BJP or not vote to BJP might be something else. So do you see that dichotomy when you do the analysis as well? There's a very clear dichotomy and I want to give you three or four reasons why the women vote was, uh, why, why this women vote moved towards the BJP, the construction of the women vote. See, the first is, uh, this uh, one of the questions that I asked in the book, and there's a whole chapter on this, as you would see, uh, was that is this just an accident of history, or, uh, or is it just a correlation that just at the time as women vote was being constructed and more women coming out, they were moving to BJP, or was the BJP actively strategizing to do this, and did these strategies work, and what were these strategies? The first is that uh, Mr. Modi himself directly fronted this outreach. Uh, Jay uh, would know this better than me, that even in Gujarat when he was chief minister from 2002 onwards, uh, a, a very strong factor for his success was a women vote. Mr. Modi was almost like, uh, and I've used this term in the book, almost like a sanskari sex symbol in Gujarat. Um, uh, uh, and this is true. And, you know, uh, in 2002 when I used to cover rallies, um, when you, every day we used to say chapani chati, um, he used to say it multiple times, I think, and you could see a visible reaction among women voters or in the rallies. Uh, and it was it was a very different kind of reaction. We didn't write about, we didn't really understand it then. But there was a very clear women support backing Modi in Gujarat. Um, uh, in 2007, for example, Mr. Modi did all women sabhas. That became a clear strategy even before the looks, even before the election was announced. Um, so you know, uh, and this became and Modi brought that to Delhi when he came to became prime minister. We, on the Narad index that we created for the book, we find that if you track all of Mr. Modi's speeches from the time from 14 to now as prime minister, among the top five things he talks about is women. It's higher than what the BJP talks about for women. So that's one. Second, uh, they specifically went and brought in women into the leadership structures, like I was saying, in the Karikarani Mandals, uh, at least five were always women and so on. Mr. Modi uh, did a lot of all women meetings talking about women. That, you know, everybody can talk the talk. Uh, that's not enough. Second was if you, representation. The BJP today has the highest women representation among Lok Sabha MPs by proportion in the Lok Sabha. In the Lok Sabha. It had 58, it, it, um, it, it, it had, uh, um, so that's one compared to every other party. And not all being dynasts, which is very important. Sorry, because, sorry. And not all being sorry. dynasts, because yeah. a, a of the others are essentially dynasts. Yeah. Correct. Then you look at Mr. Modi's Council of Ministers. Between 14 to 20, he had, see, women representation in India has historically been very low at the ministerial level. But Mr. Modi's Council of Ministers had 12.7% women representation, higher uh, than both UPA 1 and 2 of Anmohan Singh, which was supposed to be a very progressive government, which was 11.2, and higher than the Vajpayee government before it, which was at 9%. Uh, Nirmala Sitharaman, for example, is the first woman finance minister of India uh, uh, after Indira Gandhi. Indira Gandhi also held dual charge as prime minister. The first, so you know, you have prominent ministries being given to women. This Republic Day, you would have seen so much of um, um, uh, 
uh, women uh, in in the military roles. Uh, see, the the bringing of women into military roles is not the BJP's creation. That was the way from before. But if if you see the showcasing of the Rafael pilot, you see the showcasing of so many women contingent commanders who, uh, who are women. Uh, you see both BSF police and so on. This is a political uh, move. In fact, defense by bureaucracy is often the most conservative. Uh, in fact, the biggest opposition to bringing more women in has come from within these services. So, Mr. Modi has aggressively moved it and positioned that. This is not an accident. If you look at the BJP's um, manual of the women, it talks about, all it, uh, it talks about women achievers from Deepa Malik to Indra Nui to, uh, to, uh, to those in the forces. You look at the, the NDA now has got women coming in. After the Supreme Court judgment, you look at the bharti's in the police force and the paramilitary forces in the last five years, it's more than before. Now, at the party level, the BJP's office bearers, 16 over 16.9 percent office bearers, highest representation of women is with BJP, 16.9 percent, compared with other progressive parties, supposedly progressive parties, CPM, 10.7 percent, that includes Brinda Karat, uh, Trimunal Congress, 13 percent. CPI 11%, NCP 10.8%, Congress 8.5% and that includes Sonia Gandhi and Priyanka Gandhi. Um, now, um, so you, when you see that, the BJP has been walking the talk on women. And finally and most importantly, on the beneficiary model. Um, see, uh, every government has women-focused schemes. Let's leave that aside for the moment. Um, look at the schemes which were not women specific, where women, women benefit from as a direct consequence of government policy. You mentioned Ajwala. Let me give you PM Avas Yojana. PM Avas, you see, this is a country in which women did not have inheritance rights until 2005. If my sister and I have, have a claim on ancestral property of my father, my sister in 2005 would not have that claim unless my father willed it herself, himself. So, Only in 2005, the Supreme Court said, that um, uh, you can have it, but only from now. If your father died before that, you won't. In August 2020, the Supreme Court ruled that in perpetuity, it doesn't matter when your parents died, your husband, the, the sister and uh, brother both have equal rights on access to property. In such a patriarchal country, in PM Avaz Yojana, 17.5 million houses were built in this country. 68% were given either in names of women alone or jointly built for women and husbands. That is because the government decided that these houses have to be given to the women in the first instance. And what are these houses? This is 1.2 lakh rupees coming into your account yourself, which you have to build. And after you certain verification, the second tranche comes. Many of these women who have got houses now in such a patriarchal country in their name, 68% of these 17 uh, million. Uh, by the way, in UP, for example, uh, um, so only 5.6 million of this went to men alone. Everything else went to women in their names. Many of these women will at least vote for BJP once mm. and probably twice. Probably twice. Yeah. No, absolutely. And so this is this is a much broader issue than just electoral schemes alone. I, I want to give you another example. Sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, see, look at other schemes which are not women focused. PM Mudra Yojana, 68% beneficiaries are women. PM Avas Yojana, I've already mentioned, 56.9%. Atal Pension Yojana, 56%. Uh, the Jandan Yojana, 53%. Uh, the PM Jeevan Jyoti Yojana, 40%. Stand Up India, 81% of the beneficiaries have, have been women women founders. So you, when you see this in totality, that helps you understand why are women voters moving towards the BJP in, in a way that never happened before 2014. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and this, this has happened across generational levels. Like not just the, a block of voters from say 20 to 40 or 40 to 60. It's it's happened throughout, right? So Jay, to enter into our last closing phase, the last 10, 15 minutes of our podcast, I want to I, I want to start with you and then go to uh, Nalin on this point about the 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 next step, right? Because uh, 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 I I don't want to say epitaph, but Nalin hints this at various chapters on his book. That what next, right? Is this only is are these changes only limited to BJP or is this saying somewhere else? So now we see Mr. Kejriwal uh, in Delhi starting to take a very nuanced position over many issues that he probably in his RTI days or bureaucratic days would have been. Are completely opposed to because what of what Nalin said that these issues are not might not be ideologically BJP issues they might be issues within the psyche of Indian electoral voters but because Narendra Modi may have brought them into front and center now 
parties are being forced to take positions and because congress is sort of confused in taking positions on many issues kejriwal has realized that i have i have to position myself on, on the center of right scheme to the bjp on many of these issues that's why you you have many of his statements where he refuses to make statements or you know on article 370 he completely opposes his his uh, his friends in delhi were crestfallen after uh, listening to his statements but my thing was he is here to win elections boss he doesn't care about offending ideological uh, folks now I, I, that is my reading of what kejriwal is doing right so do you see that trend going to other parties also jay and then next uh, coming to malin right after yeah very much i mean in andhra you 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 find uh, both the ysr and tdp you know having some shades of hindutva right <laughs> uh so i i do see you know the spectrum moving to the right you know with more and more parties trying to have that language have that sort of a conversation with the voters mm-hmm. uh, i also see in a way many parties trying to take uh, a leaf out of the earlier bjp so when kejriwal speaks about traders when he's speaking for them right he's trying to again pick up an earlier bjp which perhaps has, has now got somewhere lost in the woods so i think uh this it's not about bjp it's about having ideas that people resonate with from time to time so you know you can sometimes say mr modi is more left there's an idea that resonates with the people right what would be that section right so i think it's about picking that i that i those ideas that resonate with the people the bjp has been at the forefront of it and soon many parties will be at the forefront they will also pick up similar ideas so i see very very platonically very platonically absolutely so nali because you know in us there is a very funny thing when people talk about socialism joe biden and nancy pelosi the leaders of the democratic party say that we are not a socialist country we are not a socialist country in india you have in the up elections you have a party that actually goes by the name of samajwadi party being the principal opponent now to the bjp and essentially not even bjp's uh, uh, own give socialism a bad word they might be against socialism now whatever your uh, you know whatever our sort of uh, ideological uh, perspective might be on whether india should be a market friendly country or a socialist country the fact is that right now bjp has taken over a lot of these uh, government centric approaches to many economic issues right hmm. the past by bjp right I, i'm coming sort of going back 10 chapters into your book when you talk about the economic when uh, uh, Vajpayee almost wanted, through you know the disinvestment policy or the financial uh, policies, to go towards a more market friendly. And that era, from I would say two thousand one to two thousand seven eight ish, sort of six years, uh, four years of NDA and two years of UPA, you did have sort of similar uh, things. And then, of course, the two thousand seven eight crash happens, and then the UPA gets run over by the you know the NAC. And I mean, you know, the, 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 and, and we all know how that uh, came along. So, how do you recommend? Can, like is can be is there a, an economic divide at all in india in terms of how to approach or is it or is it certain now that you almost have to take a government centric approach and then whatever market sense because air india's disinvestment is not going to get you any votes as much as yeah. essential as it is to india you're not going to get it, any votes of that right so how do you view that so i think there is a, a historically there's been a, a deep distrust in india of 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 capital um of market capital um yeah. so for example look at one of the biggest critiques of the bjp economically this charge of crony capitalism right yeah. uh, uh, that uh, in fact if you remember uh, 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 you know people talk about the bjp's u turn on uh, or the mr modi's u turn on the farmers bill um uh, before that the first u turn he made in his first term was regarding the land acquisition act and why did that happen because of the jaib of suit boot ki sarkar that was his first u turn and even the farmers bill it, it, it was removed for two reasons one because in punjab it became a much larger issue and the farmers bill became a question of izzat um uh, but in western you but in other places it was becoming a question of uh, um it was linked to that so uh, i think politically people don't vote vote for ideology economic ideology one of the reasons in the bjp's economic model you know we'll try to see whether mr modi's economic bjp model of economics or is it just personalities that um, that matter so we tracked 
um, uh, 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 certain uh, uh, pointers on data on inflation in particular, both for the Vajpayee, uh, Vajpayee uh, Manmohan Singh and Modi years nationally. And then we tracked over the last eight years, all state governments, both BJP and non-BJP. And we found a very interesting finding, which is this, that between 14 to 19 uh, at the national level, if there's one thing that stood out was that the BJ, that Mr. Modi's government kept inflation at lower levels than the previous government. Uh, the inflation levels went down. Of course, that changed with the coronavirus. And right now, we've had very high inflation uh, since 2020, 2020 onwards. Uh, but in up till 19, there were two very clear trends, both uh, uh, wholesale index and food price indexes. The inflation level was much lower than before at the central level. And then when we compared BJP governments and non-BJP state level governments, we found that the pattern being repeated again. So that was that, that tells you that this is not just about Mr. Modi. There, there is a clear economic viewpoint in this because the inflation is what hits voters the most. That also tells you what the BJP's biggest challenge now is. Because inflation has gone through the roof uh, in the last year, year and a half. One of the reasons why um, the economic... Um, uh, you know, you've you've had you've had there's been lot, right now after uh, the coronavirus induced um, uh, pan, uh, uh, lockdowns. Only now the GDP has returned to the same level as it was before the lockdown started, right? Um, and we we get into somewhere around seven percent growth or something like that. Uh, if you look at the quarter by quarter data, um, one of the reasons why the lack of jobs or much higher growth rates or the lack of much higher growth has not hit BJP so far or, or relatively it hasn't been hit so far is because because public if you you know we track the RBI surveys over the last 20 the RBI is in more than 20 cities and because it's done over 20 years and it's done by the RBI you know they give you a very good time series of data to look at they track public sentiment on what do people think about the economy in the last 12 months what do they think about their own job prospects in the last 12 months and what do they think over the next 12 months when you see this you it gives you exactly why bjp has been winning um see a lot of the liberal assumption has been that some of people are stupid inko nokri nahi mil rahi phir bhi ye bjp ke liye vote kar rahe hain for identity uh, that is completely wrong it's not like people don't know they are being hit after demonetization if you see the public sentiment in the rbi surveys it tanks uh, if, when, they, when you ask them about the economy or about like, their own own uh, job prospects the difference is when you ask them what do you think about the next 12 months about your job prospect or the economy it is goes through the roof and in 2019 when the election happened their perception about the future was higher than it than what it was in 2014 when mr modi won one in 2014 and that tells you that people still felt hopeful that the future will be better for us. Now, there's a caveat to this. Historically, the Pew Research Survey show us that Indians in general are more hopeful about the future than people in the West. Um, keeping that in mind, even then, this is what has been the case. I and mean, I think even after the coronavirus, that trend is continuing. But if it doesn't sustain, that will be a real challenge for the BJP. The UP election will tell us that. Absolutely. So, uh, and this is a good preview point that you've given uh, me about the UP elections. Jay, uh, before we wrap up, any 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 last minute predictions you want to tell us about UP? Uh, if 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 people have listened to us for an hour, they, they deserve some numbers, na, Jay. So, who's going to win UP? Come on. <laughs> no, no, no. These days, I've stopped giving numbers. I only give Gyan. So, wow. <laughs> so I, I, I still think the BJP is ahead, uh, yeah. maybe marginally. There, there has been uh, an increased resistance, a little bit of friction we've seen in the recent times due to economic issues. But I think largely the BJP is, uh, in terms of momentum, I think it's still ahead of the SP. That's yeah. what happens. Perfect. Uh, Lalit, you know, on a lighter note, I mean, this this has been an excellent discussion, but uh, uh, our folks, like I, I'm, uh, our podcast listeners know that I'm, I'm big into sports and stuff and your books on the Olympics and uh, cricket are next on my agenda. I've read one of your books on, you know, the Olympics and and I certainly the changing phase because uh, I, I, I came to US in a time where we would, we were cheering every one medal for India, right? And it would be mm -hmm. so hard to get India's streaming. So from there to us, for us to go to seven medals, 
skills and hopefully to 2025 in the next few months. I think uh, you, you chronicle that very well, but I have to read the other uh, book when you t- talk about the changing faces. And um, uh, and, and, and maybe maybe one day we'll talk about cricket also. Jay and I were talking about Shane Warne and his passing away. What a huge loss it is for cricket romantics uh, like us. But um, but this has been an excellent uh, discussion and an excellent book. Uh, Dalin, any closing comments that you have that you think we did not cover on uh, on this or any 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 sort of things? My my biggest takeaway uh, from from this book before I come to you was um, about this was not a story about the BJP, uh, just the BJP. This was a story about India and how there are certain issues that affected India in the fifties and sixties, where which may have been ignored or you know may have been put on the back burner have come to the forefront so more than the bjp's emergence this is almost india's sort of change in complexion of how india voted or how certain issues became the center and certain issues did not so uh, things that were taken for granted say in the 70s and 80s are no longer the, the no longer the issues and the more we think about it the more the national the leader in india we've gotten the more localized the elections have become Lately, when when Manmohan Singh was the Prime Minister of India, who was a arguably a <clears throat> weaker Prime Minister than Narendra Modi in terms of political popularity and so forth, and you know his hold over the cabinet, the election had almost become a central election, quasi presidential, because Narendra Modi was offering that I have an alternative vision of Manmohan Singh. Now you, it's already established that Narendra Modi is a leader, and there is you know there are few alternatives at the same scale. Yet there are five hundred and forty three elections being. Sh- uh, fought where Narendra Modi is personally, or I won't say Mr. Modi personally, but 120 MPs are being uh, changed away because one could argue that if it, this was just a uh, national presidential elections, what was the need to switch 120 sitting MPs, right? Why? Why? But I, I think there is a recognition of that happening. So that was my pers- like my understanding from this book. Now I may be completely off, but your uh, your analysis and your thinking. Um, Adit, thank you very much for um, for this lovely conversation and for your very generous comments. Um, um, I would just add a couple of things as closing comments. Um, one, I think, the, in the um, in the book, I've called Narendra Modi the new Nehru for the right. Um, and one of the reasons why I say that is that Modi's impact on the Indian polity, which goes to the point you were making, is it's as deep and as long-ranging as Nehru's was in the 50s. Because Nehru defined that a certain template of the idea of India. Modi, who's the exact inverted mirror image of the, of, of Nehru ideologically, um, uh, his impact is as deep as Nehru's. No other prime minister since Nehru has had this kind of an impact in changing the playing field of what it means uh, uh, for the idea of India. The idea of India itself is being shifted. Um, every other prime minister since then has not tampered with that basic idea. Modi brings to the table something very different and because of his uh, his popularity and the, his impact is much more deeper. That's one point. The second point I wanted to make was that you know, at the end of the book, uh, I've listed five major challenges for the BJP going forward and a couple of advantages. Uh, that's in the book. But what I do want to say is that the BJP post-2014, the new BJP, for... Um, the kind of party building and cadre building we have seen, whether you agree with the BJP or not, that's a different question. Um, his, historically, at a national level, we have not seen party building of this kind since the 1950s or the pre-1950s Congress. This is party building on a scale that is unprecedented. You know, it is now the largest political party in the world, overtaking the Chinese Communist Party. We should not take that lightly. Because you know, some people, somebody would say, yeah, what's the big deal? India and China are the two biggest countries in the world. India is the biggest democracy. Of course, your largest party will be from India. That's not correct. Because China, you can only be a member of Chinese Communist Party. It's not a democracy. Right? In India, even at the height of the BJP's greatest triumph in 2019, all, almost 60% of this country or more than that did not vote for BJP. In such a polity, when you have so much of deep membership and cadre building, some of these would have come to you because they want to be close to power. Some of them will go away when you lose power. But this kind of deep cadre building has not been seen in India since the pre-50s Congress. So I think the BJP is much more deeper, much more stronger than it looks. Uh, And for the next 10-15 years, whether it wins or loses elections, you you can always lose an election here and there. It will be 
the pole of the primary pole or one of the two primary poles of our national politics for the next 10 15 years fascinating jay any closing comments you have uh, no very much uh, i i sort of endorse what nalan says it is going to be the primary pole uh, what you have to note is that a distance that the indian national congress covered uh, in perhaps 60 years or or, or 60 odd years the bjp has covered that distance in something like uh, about 35 years odd okay so uh, now uh, and the, with the congress waning any other party uh, you know trying to occupy a space as large as that would need to put in that many years of focused effort and a great bulwark behind it so i think that's that's really what nalin is trying to say that you know you you reached that criticality and gone above it so clearly the bjp remains a principal force fascinating um one thing which we forgot to mention but i'll end this podcast with that and it's a very important because on a broader level these are the issues that the book talks about on a micro level there is this a fascinating passage that we talk, i actually was on another podcast nalin last week where i talk mm-hmm. i reference this passage from your book where you said that Uh, or Christoph Jaffelo and uh, uh, some other scholar got that uh, understanding of UP's caste wrong. Where you said Jagdambika Bal, Pals were uh, OBCs in one constituency, they were Thakurs in another constituency, and how complicated it was. You out- outline sort of the complexity of the caste in UP. I-, I forget which chapter it was because I mean, but I, I had it highlighted in my Kindle showing that this is what. this is what it was so at macro micro level the book talks about this and at macro level what we talked about uh, but i i guess that's the uh, that's the direction we're taking I, what what i take from this is irrespective of whatever the result of up happens in 3 days from now the changes that we've seen to indian polity are here to stay uska electoral impact kya hota hai we'll we'll find out in the next few years to come but Thank you, Nalin. You've been very generous. Thank you, Jay. You've been very generous, both of you, with your time. Uh, appreciate. And I'm sorry we went a little overboard, but this was a fascinating discussion. No, yeah. We, I, Thank you very much, Adit. Uh, such a pleasure you. doing this. Thank you. Yeah. And guys, please like, share, subscribe, follow them on social media. Buy the book by the new BJP by Nalin Mehta. It's a fantastic book. Write, comment, and tell us what you think about the book. We have we have uh, featured some reviews as well, and I'm looking uh, looking forward to reading uh, uh, what you guys say. Till then, it's goodbye from us at Mind Makers, and we'll be back next week with more. Thank you.